We've now got to a point where we've got the basic design right. Uh, we've got a car which weighs about seven tons. It's powered by a jet engine and a rocket motor. It's 13.5 meters long. It's got 125,000 horsepower. It's the most powerful car that's ever been built. And the fascinating thing about it is it looks completely different to anything we've ever seen before. One of the goals of this project is to use this car, this hopefully an iconic vehicle, to teach young people about science, to get young people excited about science, and to encourage them to stick with science, technology, mathematics, so that they can be the people of the future who become the engineers who are solving you know, the problems that we have in this world. Man, that was hard work. Coming down to 300, looking for the recovery crew, can't see them. Dust on the outside, recovery crew visual. In 1997, Andy Green set a new world land speed record, reaching the supersonic speed of 763.035 miles per hour. The Thrust SSC project was led by Richard Noble, who himself had set a world land speed record in 1983. Now, led again by Richard and piloted by Andy, with aerodynamics research funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, they want to do it all again. But this time, not only are they aiming to reach a speed of a thousand miles per hour, they also want to inspire a new generation of engineers and scientists. Richard explains the background to the project. This is a quite extraordinary story. Um, it was the idea of Lord Drayson. Lord Drayson was the Minister for Defence Equipment and, uh, and Support for the Ministry of Defence, and he had a real problem. His problem was simply that uh, there was a shortage of engineers, and he realised that back in the last century when Britain did these fantastic aerospace projects, like, for instance, the Vulcan bomber, the TSR-2, the Lightning Fighter, and, uh, and of course, Concorde, he realised that during that period there was simply no shortage of engineers. Why? Well, because basically all the kids at school were very fired up by these tremendous programmes. And um, then, of course, Britain stopped doing these projects, and so, consequently, um, the, the supply of engineers began to fall off. So much so that, at the moment, uh, 24,500 go through the system, but it's been steady at that for the last 10 years, whereas the university capacities have increased by about 40%. So um, it's a real problem, because when we look forward to uh, what's going to happen in this country, everything we know, everything we touch, everything we use has got to change. Um, our houses have got to change, our transport's got to change, our aircraft, our railways, our cars. Everything's got to change. We've got to move into a low-carbon world. And the reality is we haven't got any engineers, so um, how on earth are we going to do it? So we set about doing the ultimate land speed record project. Now, we've held the land speed record twice before with Thrust 2 and Thrust SSC, but these were cars which uh, where we literally had to sort of um, scrape around to get um, the, uh, the, the old technology, which is all we had access to. So, for instance, the Thrust SSC engines were 1960s technologies, now they're 30 years old. With this project, of course, now we're able to use the most advanced technology we possibly can. And so we've got, the, for instance, the Eurofighter engine, the EJ200, which is the most advanced jet engine anywhere. And we've also got a huge rocket motor. It's an incredible program. And I think Lord Drayson's right. I think what's going to happen is it's going to really excite people. And as a result of this, um, we're going to be able to run our programs through uh, every single school in the country. And the kids are going to be able to come down here and actually see the car being built and follow it all through. How does it actually link in to the school side of things? It fits in with the school curriculum, in point of fact, really very well. And, of course, there's a focus on STEM, which is science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So there's a bit of everything in there. In point of fact, once you get into it, you realise that there's such a wide range of school subjects that, um, that impinge on this project. You realise that actually it's incredibly valuable. So the teachers will be able to use it for a wide range of activities. Ben Evans is a research assistant at the School of Engineering at Swansea University. With funding from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, Ben is doing the computational modelling of the aerodynamics research for the project. Obviously a car that's travelling at faster than the speed of sound, um, and hopefully 1,000 miles per hour, one of the massive things that we need to understand about how this car behaves is, is how does the air flow around it. 
Um, and essentially the study of aerodynamics is the study of airflow. What does air do to objects that it's flowing around? Now traditionally, this kind of uh, research might have been done in wind tunnels. There are numbers of problems with, with running this, this kind of application in a wind tunnel. One of them is that we're running across the ground and you can't roll a ground in a wind tunnel at a thousand miles per hour. But today, with the advent of modern computing, we can do the same thing that you would traditionally do in a wind tunnel, but on a big supercomputer. So we come into the project by, by modelling the aerodynamic flows around Bloodhound. And, and when I'm talking about aerodynamic flows, everything from the general total flow around the car to things like the flow through the duct leading into the, the jet engine, uh, the flow within the, the hub uh, of, of the wheels. Every area of the car that has an aerodynamic flow, an airflow associated with it, we've been modelling at Swansea using our computational modelling capabilities. It's a 128 processor system. So essentially, you have 128 PC type processors all talking to each other. So it's almost like having 128 desktop PCs sat together, connected up cleverly, and they're all talking to each other. In very simple terms, that's, that's what it is. And that's, that's the, the supercomputing system that we have at the School of Engineering at Swansea University. One of the big things that we're trying to understand on this project is, is what happens to these strong shock waves that are generated when you travel faster than the speed of sound. Now obviously there are lots of aircraft um, that we can think of, Concorde would be a perfect example of, of aircraft that travel faster than the speed of sound, and they generate shock waves. Now a shock wave occurs when an object travels through the air faster than the speed at which it can tell the air ahead of it that it's coming. So you or I, if we were walking down the street or if we were driving down the motorway in our car, we're sending pressure waves forwards ahead of us that are telling the air ahead of you that you're coming so that it can move out of the way. Now, of course, once you start moving at the same speed that you're sending out those pressure waves, it gets impossible for you to tell the air ahead of you that you're coming. So what happens is you generate a shock wave. Now, we see those on aircraft traveling high up in the atmosphere, um, and we even hear them. You know, if, if an aircraft travels overhead faster than the speed of sound, you hear that shock wave in terms of this sonic boom. Now, what is a much more tricky concept to deal with is what happens when those shockwaves are generated much, much closer to the ground, in the case of Bloodhound, just a metre or so off the ground. What happens when those shockwaves interact with the surface? I mean, we'll be running on a desert, so we're trying to understand you know, where those shockwaves are going to impinge on the desert surface. What are they going to do when they impinge on the desert surface? Are they going to reflect and, and bounce back up against the car? Where exactly on the car are we going to be generating shockwaves? So, Understanding that is absolutely critical. How much danger is involved? Hopefully, I mean, the, the whole idea and the whole ethos of the project is that we minimise the danger. Obviously, if you put a human being in a car and you project him at 1,000 miles per hour across the surface of a desert, there's danger that you just you can't avoid. But the whole purpose of, of the year that we've just spent doing research on this is trying to understand exactly how a car like this will behave at these kind of speeds. From my point of view, that's aerodynamically. There are other people on the team who are responsible for trying to understand structurally how the car will behave. Electronically, systems-wise, how, how the car is going to behave. The dangers, you know, the kind of things that you might think of, you know, if it, if it hits a bump and the angle at which the car is, is approaching the air changes, you know, what are, the, what are the change in forces acting on the car? Is it going to take off? Is it going to stay on the ground? And, and trying to understand all of that and make sure that we have a car that's stable, it's not only stable, but it's, it's drivable, it's steerable, it's very important. And we believe uh, now uh, we're, we're approaching the point where we can say, yes, we, we think we have a concept here that we can achieve this safely. But of course, when it comes to doing the runs, everything will be done incrementally in terms of stepping up the speed. It won't be just a case of, you know, we've run a computer model that tells us this car's going to be fine at 1,000 miles per hour, so let's just shoot down the runway at 1,000 at miles per hour. The whole ethos of the project is we do things stage by stage, we analyse the data that's coming back, we compare it with the data that the computer models have been giving us and you know, if, if there are any discrepancies between the computer models that we've been running at Swansea and the, the data that we get off the runs in the desert then we have to stop and say hang on a minute, you know, what's going on here? So absolutely safety is completely critical. So where did the name Bloodhound come from? It isn't the most obvious title for the fastest car in the world. Ben explains more. Ron Ayres, who has taken the role of uh, head of performance for the car many years ago, in fact, he worked on a missile that was called Bloodhound. And the project initially took on the, the, the term Bloodhound just as a code name uh, in the early days of the project. But as the project research year has rolled by, we've just kind of got to know the car as being called Bloodhound, and it's, it seems to have fit, and uh, we've stuck with it. 
Some cynics will no doubt be critical of the carbon footprint that will be left by the car. However, Ben stresses that the research going into the design will lead to many more positives than negatives in terms of potential benefits for society. Any activity like this does have this you know, carbon footprint that we're talking about these days. You can't deny that. I mean, if you compare you know, what we're doing with, for example, Formula One, you know, it's, it's a drop in the ocean in terms of our carbon footprint. And specifically what we're trying to achieve through the Bloodtown Project is to motivate young people, particularly, um, to stick with science, engineering, mathematics, because you know, we live in a world where you know, the, problems, the problems in this world are being sh screamed about and shouted about. You know, we, we're told we're living in this carbon economy and the, the world is warming up and it's all our fault. Well, lots of these problems, in part, are going to be solved by engineers and scientists and mathematicians. And we do have a problem, I think, that some of these subjects in school at the moment are just not attractive options for young people. So one of the goals of this project is to use this car, this hopefully an iconic vehicle, to teach young people about science, to get young people excited about science, and to encourage them to stick with science, technology, mathematics, so that they can be the people of the future who become the engineers who are solving you know, the problems that we have in this world. You talk about the, uh, the educational aspects, the technological aspects. What sort of research could come about as a result of this project that could make a difference to our lives in the future in, in other areas? That's, that's a great question. Computational modelling, which is, I mean, the broad, in the broader sense, what we're doing at Swansea University, essentially, we're taking um, the governing equations of any physical problem, which in, in many cases is, is a set of partial differential equations. So uh, in the case of aerodynamics, the partial differential equations that we're solving are called the Navier-Stokes equations. So these equations describe a viscous fluid flow. So that's, that's a viscous aerodynamic problem. But any set of partial differential equations that describe a physical system, so it could be a structural system, it could be an electromagnetic system, can be solved using essentially the same techniques that we're using and developing specifically for Bloodhound. For example, I, I sit in an office at Swansea University and the researcher on the desk next to me is studying hemodynamics, so blood flow through the arterial system. And one of her uh, research projects at the moment is to, to understand uh, valves within the heart. Uh, and how they, they react to different uh, hemodynamic blood flow uh, scenarios. So the, the spin-offs in terms of you know, the kind of things that we're developing in the world of computational modelling are massive. You know, any system that you can describe essentially by partial differential equations can be solved using the methods of computational modelling. We're talking about something, a, a car that looks a little bit like an aircraft travelling at the kind of speeds that aircraft travel at. So the kind of technology that we're developing specifically for Bloodhound, you know, trying to capture shock waves accurately have uh, direct implications for the aerospace industry, obviously. You know, that's the kind of place you would expect to find objects travelling at these sort of speeds. But you know, in, in, in the same you know, research group that I'm working in, you know, we're developing codes to solve electromagnetic problems, so lightning strike of aircraft, things like that. There's a wide range of, of applications, yes. I know at the moment Airbus, they've got a project called the 2020 project, I believe, where by the year 2020 they're trying to develop an aircraft that's 50% more fuel efficient and 50% quieter. Now that can only be achieved really, I mean, by optimising designs and that will be done through computational modelling, partly through computational modelling. Um, so these, these technologies that we're developing are going to you know, continue to be used in aerospace and aircraft design as optimization tools. So you try and understand you know, what is the perfect shape for a wing to minimize drag, to optimize your lift-drag ratio, um, to minimize noise. You know, where should the jet engines on an aircraft be positioned to minimize noise disturbance over the ground? These are the kind of things that you know, really, to get down to the nitty-gritty optimization uh, level, we need to be running computer models on. So the engineering adventure has begun, and both Richard Noble and Ben Evans say that the EPSRC support for the project has made a significant difference. What has happened here is that the EPSRC has come on board right at the start, has funded the uh, Swansea Aerodynamics team for three years, and so that's enabled us to get a really hot and really fast start. Certainly the uh, computational modelling of the aerodynamics aspect of the project would not have been possible uh, without EPSRC funding. Uh, the research group that I'm a part of that's working on this project um, is funded by EPSRC and it's, it's a simple case of we wouldn't have been able to do it um, without the funding. So what will it be like to drive the fastest car in the world? 
Richard Noble has a pretty good idea from his own experience behind the wheel of Thrust 2 in 1983, when he set a world land speed record of 633.468 miles per hour. You're not there for any kind of excitement and, and basically if you've got a driver who gets all excited you've got the wrong person, you know. It's a very cold-blooded um, process. 150 looking for Nimburn. Nice light together, slightly wriggly, 200 looking for Max. You're getting off the line with full power, so you've got 35,000 horsepower between naught and 300 miles an hour, the car's all over the place, so you've got to work really hard to keep the front wheels in front of the back wheels and keep it all going. You're driving down a lane which is only 50 foot wide, and then um, uh, you get to the sort of um, what we call the threshold speed, which is about 300 miles an hour, and it seems to sort of stabilise. And then uh, 300 to 550 is boring because it's more of the same really, but once you get about 550 it gets very interesting because the airflow starts to go supersonic over bits of it, and you start seeing the shockwaves build up. and. Um, the extraordinary thing too, I found, was that your mental process, I've been doing this for a long time, so your mental process is speed right up, and everything happens in very, very slow motion. So you can see every single detail on the ground come up and go underneath the car at 650 miles an hour. And then you go through the measured mile, and then you've got to think about stopping, and this is where the fun starts. And you, you've, got to go th you've got to allow the engine three seconds to cool at 98%, and that seems like an eternity. And then only then can you fire the brake parachute. And when the brake parachute comes out, um, you get between 5 and 6 G decelerations. So you're losing speed at about 130 odd miles an hour per second. And the human body isn't really capable of taking this. So you get an extraordinary effect called the somatographic illusion. And it upsets the inner ear and you think you're driving vertically downwards into the centre of the earth. Start with your, bring it back. Bring it back. Over 600. Shoot one. Good shoot. Both oils, no worries. And then you're down to literally 400 miles an hour or so, and then you've got to bring the wheel brakes in at 200. That's the process. So Andy Green is uh, again the man at this time. What sort of character is he? Andy's very, very cool. He's um, an absolute first-class mathematician. He's got 2,000 hours of fast jet experience. He's extremely good at this. He's always the best in the world. It's really as simple as that. And uh, this whole car has been designed around him. Man, that was hard work. Coming down to 300. I'm looking for the recovery crew. Can't see them. Dust on the outside. Recovery crew visual. 